Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Just make us wake up, because this is, after all, the graveyard shift. And uh, I know it's going to be a bit difficult for people to keep awake, but we will all try. So may I warmly welcome you to this session on, it's titled Myths, Realities, Politics, and the Imagination, um, post-war uh, Sri Lanka and women's writing. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with Sri Lanka, so I thought uh, as the moderator, maybe I, I should start by giving a slight, uh, a brief sketch about the country. Uh, Sri Lanka has been called by more than 68 names, starting from antiquity. Uh, the Buddhists call it Amradeep, the Tamils call it Elankei, uh, Farsian used to call it Shetsu Ku, uh, Ptolemites, Taprobana and Arabs called it Serendib, then Ceylon, Ceylon, and uh, Zeylan, Tambapani, and so on and so forth. Perhaps because of its very strategic location in the nautical routes uh, of the Indian Ocean. Uh, waves of migration to Sri Lanka from India, different kingdoms of India during different times, the Java, Nis, and the Malaccan Straits, uh, the, and Arabia at different points in time, uh, left the island with uh, three main ethnic groups, the Sinhalese, the Tamils, and the Muslims. Uh, Sinhalese forming about 75% of the population. The Tamil segment comprises of two group, groups, uh, Indian Tamils and the Sri Lankan indigenous Tamils. 12% uh, uh, of Sri Lankan Tamils and 6% of the Indian Tamils. The Muslims who trace their origins to uh, uh, um, uh, migration from Arabia account for about 7.5% of the population. And there are also Burghers, uh, Farsis, and uh, um, uh, the indigenous Vabdas, all coming to about 1% of the population. And the Sinhalese speak Sinhala, uh, the Indo uh, Aryan language, and the Tamils, the Dravidian language of Tamils, and the Muslims, interestingly, speak uh, Tamil in Sri Lanka. Um, and again, more than 90% of the population uh, of Sinhalese are Buddhists, uh, and uh, the Tamils are overwhelmingly. Hindu, 7% uh, of Sri Lankans are Christians from among the Sinhalese, Tamils, and Burger communities. That is a very fast, rapid take on the demography of the country. Um, and this afternoon session brings together a trick gift of Sri Lankan women writers from different domains, disciplines, and areas of interest. And I would actually like to ask them to introduce themselves to the audience. So to begin with, Amina Hussein, who is a creative writer and a publisher at the very corner there. How would you like to introduce yourself, Amina? Hello, everybody. As Maitri has kindly already said, my name is Amina Hussein. And firstly, I thank the Lahore Literary Festival for bringing all of us to the beautiful city of Lahore. And thank you all very much for coming to listen to us. So I am trained as a sociologist, but I have been writing fiction. I don't practice sociology anymore. I did it for 10 years. But I think it really helped me in how I see the world and how my fiction is carved out. Uh, I also co-founded a publishing house. It's called Pereira Hussein Publishing. And we do Sri Lankan fiction and non-fiction, and uh, we publish in English. I have published two collections of short stories, one novel which we will be talking about at this session, and I'm currently at work on the 14th century Moroccan traveler Ibn Battuta, who visited Sri Lanka, and I have mapped out his route and done a travelogue on that as well. And shall we ask Babani Fonseca on my left here, a writer, lawyer, human rights activist. Uh, can you please give us a brief introduction about your work, Babani? Uh, thanks, my dear, and again, thank you to the organizers. I'm Bhavani Fonseca. I'm a lawyer by training, but worked as a human rights activist, uh, researcher, advocate, uh, troublemaker, everything in Sri Lanka. Um, I'm based with a think tank based in Colombo, which looks at broadly uh, peace, reconciliation, human rights issues, and my 
work in the last couple of years has uh, been around reconciliation issues, and I'll be talking about it in terms of Sri Lanka's own um, legacies and uh, struggles for peace and justice. So a lot has been on transitional justice, and you might all think, what is transitional justice? I will talk about that. Uh, so I'm a lawyer, activist, researcher, as well as Sri Lanka, um, working in Sri Lanka, I've also worked uh, around the UN human rights system in Geneva and New York, raising the issue of Sri Lanka in the international fora and making, uh, using the UN system to put pressure on the Sri Lankan system to improve the human rights system. So I'll uh, maybe talk a bit about that as well at some point. Um, and more recently, really kind of with the political change in Sri Lanka in 2015, exploring ways and engaging with the government and other stakeholders in trying to get sustainable, genuine peace in Sri Lanka, and that's the big struggle right now. So, yeah, several hats, but I'll be looking at you from a writer's perspective here. Um, so, uh, architect and writer, uh, to my immediate right, uh, Sunela Jawadana. Good afternoon, uh, if you all are all still awake. Uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting us and uh, lovely people of Lahore. Um, as uh, Maitre says, I'm, I'm an environmental architect, that's my uh, profession. And uh, my great passion is environmental conservation, so I have been called an environmental activist. Uh, and yes, that's what really sort of uh, fires my batteries. <laughs> that's uh, uh, environmental activism. Writing is a hobby, and uh, this is my <coughs> first book, um, which is uh, The Line of Lanka, which is uh, quite hard to uh, pin down in terms of genre. It's, it's it's loosely a travelogue, looking at some of the histories of Sri Lanka. And yes, I, uh, I guess I wear quite a few hats, and that may be maybe because I'm a woman. Right, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to talk a little bit about the craft of writing. Um, if we say that by 2009, Sri Lanka had emerged from a 30-year-old political and ethnic conflict uh, when the brutal fighting between the Tamil uh, Tigers of Ilam and the government of Sri Lanka ceased. Yet Sri Lanka has, all, has always, be, throughout its post-independence era, been prone to violence, sporadic violence, whether it is between the student communities, whether it is between political parties or communal violence. And even after the immediate so-called uh, cessation of the war period, there's been uh, distinctive challenges due to regressive and, uh, and an authoritarian regime. Bhavani, since you have positioned yourself first and foremost as a human rights activist, uh, let me ask you, what have been the challenges and constraints of writing facts and figures during times of war and during times of no war um, and especially as a woman. Um, okay, so I thought in terms of, I think, our own work, it's very important. I know Maitri set a very quick context, but all three of our writings, as well as other work we do, is set in particular contexts. And I, in terms of craft, in terms of writing, it's very important to understand the journey Sri Lanka has also gone through from three decades of a brutal war, but conflicts, you know, numerous conflicts before that and continuing conflicts. So the war really was a very specific context in terms of the writing and the craft, but also immediate post-war, which is really post-2009. And, and that's also an important time to understand because it was at a particular juncture where it was a very powerful regime, increasing authoritarianism. And I'm just putting that in context because all the work is based on that context. 
And 2015, as I said, there was a political transition where we had democratic elections and was a smooth transition to a new government. So we kind of setting the stage in terms of three contexts. And in terms of the writing, um, my writing is really based on looking at the ground realities and trying to capture what is happening, uh, what's happened in the past, but it's fact. So fact is very much, you can't make it up, or you shouldn't be making it up, but also being very clear as a lawyer, verifying data, because something that easily shredded to pieces and countered is when it's not backed by data. So the writing really has to be grounded on the context, or shaped by context, but grounded on facts, figures, verification. And in terms of my writing, I realized while um, I wasn't willing to let the, the larger politics define what the role was going to be as a human rights activist, we keep pushing back, we keep challenging. Um, the threats, the attacks faced by many of us also defined how you present something. So the language, the framing also is very critical in terms of that context and how one can negotiate certain spaces. So that was a huge Im impediment in terms of 20, during the war as well as immediate post-war. Uh, with the transition, I think, in, from 2015, you see the craft being expanded because the space expanded. And the space really provided for critical discourse, critical thought. And in terms of my work, it was also where we could actually directly challenge the government and not have to face the repercussions. Because Sri Lanka has and continues to have one of the highest caseload on enforced disappearances, which has significantly affected many of the women. So we have um, I think about 80,000 female-headed households out of that, which is a large proportion, is disappearances, enforced disappearances. So we have, um, I think, in terms of the, I know my three is moving, that's a sign that I have to cut short my answer, but mm -hmm. just to say that the crafting mm -hmm. is defined As by context and space but also the issues. So in terms of how you raise issues of gender identity, uh, the experiences of women, and in, a, in something I guess we couldn't talk about is the conflict was in the north and east of Sri Lanka. But other areas were also affected. So you can't say it was just the north and east, but women in those areas faced much more um, hardships and direct security threats in terms of their own work, and the work I did, framing of it, was also defined by that. So I think that's a quick quick answer for a lawyer. I can go on, um, but a quick answer. Thank you, Bhavani. Okay, uh, often writers, and I'm posing this question to Amina here, um, writers use creativity as a means of engaging with dif difficult socio-political issues especially in times of conflict and tension, basically trying to articulate what cannot be articulated, uh, usually by using fiction and faction, as we all know. So exactly how have you done that in your writing? And I'm trying to put this as the more strategic question, uh, and even right in your writing as well as perhaps even in your publishing house. So I'll first talk about the creative writing and if we have time about the publishing, but if we don't, maybe I can bring it up later. I'm very happy that Bhavani went first and she set out the facts of how you would write if you're writing fact and if you're a non-fiction writer, because I'm primarily a fiction writer. And one of the beautiful things about fiction is you are not limited by, you, you can draw on a lot of sources and you know, conflate it into one character. One character can go through many different people's experiences. I did write a lot during the conflict. My short stories reflect that. But the novel that I wrote was also at, towards the end of the war, it got published. 
it got published in January 2009. In May, May 15th, I think, May 15th, I think, 2009, the war technically, the fighting technically ended. So what many people don't know is there were two conflicts that were happening in Sri Lanka. One was happening, in which almost the world knows, which was the North and the South, the Tamil Tiger and the Sri Lankan government. But in first happened in 1971, and then again 1988, 1989, we had a civil uprising between uh, the South, a Marxist group called the JVP. So my novel spoke a little bit about that, but it was actually based on a real life uh, case of inheritance. So it actually has nothing to do with war. We have personal law in Sri Lanka, and there was a personal law case of an adopted child who uh, was disinherited by the law when his father died. He took it up in court, and so it went back and forth. And I was watching this procedure. It was called Gauss versus Gauss. And so the lower court filed for the adopted son. The appeal court filed for the relatives who were fighting against him. The Supreme Court filed for the relatives, and he lost the case, the adopted son. That moved me greatly. But I couldn't write about it at that time. It happened in 1990, and that case stayed with me for a long time. I started writing it in about 2005. And what I did was, because I'm somewhat related to the, to the litigants, is I changed the gender. So there you have one freedom of fiction. I changed the gender and I made it two adopted children, siblings, instead of one. I made them different ethnicities. And I, uh, so you can see how you can play around with so much with fiction and your inspiration can be a real life case. I just want to say about, when, about writing as a woman. So I think inevitably women will see the world through female eyes. We can't help it. And, but one of the challenges I had was because one of my characters was a man and I had to see everything through his eyes, I started eavesdropping. And I started just looking at at male friends and my husband's friends. And when I wrote the draft, I sent it to, a un um, I worked very closely with the University of Iowa. I had good friends there in the writing program. I sent it across to them. And because they don't know anything about Sri Lanka, there was one comment that made me change the whole perspective. The comment was that both your characters, the girl and the boy, speak alike. But from the background, one is clearly lower middle class, and the other one is clearly upper middle class, and they can't be speaking alike. Which meant I had to go and look at language and how class affects language. For that, again, I have to eavesdrop a lot, this time going to a totally different segment that I may not normally hang out with. And that changed, that character changed because of the way that he now started speaking. He became rougher. He became more earthy, which he didn't have. And it was picked up by someone who was not belonging to Sri Lanka. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is, so a little bit about, do I have time to talk about publishing? A little bit more. Oh, okay. <laughs> so about publishing is when we were working on a book. It was a non-fiction book. As a publisher, I get lots of manuscripts. And it was a non-fiction book about a very, uh, about a Tamil politician who was in the first parliament, who was a member of the first parliament. And he was actually the, one of the earliest calls for Elam, a separate state. Because soon after independence, he declared publicly in parliament speeches, in the newspapers, he did not think the Tamils would be treated fairly. And the only way to do it was to have a separate state. Now, you can see how changed Sri Lanka was, because when he was articulating it in the 90, in post-1948, you know, 1940s and post-1948, with the he had, yes, he had freedom to say it and no one was actually up, may, they may have been upset, but he had the freedom to articulate it, whereas it was very difficult to articulate it much later on. We began working on the book before the war ended, and 
soon after, no, we began working on the book after the war ended, but with the repressive regime that Bhavani was talking about. I don't know if subconsciously we slowed down the work. I don't know whether we were like, you know, just fiddling and tweaking and wondering, okay, what's going to happen if we put this book out? But thankfully for us, the government, we had an election and the government changed in 2015. The book came out early 2016 and you, all our governments have our ills and ails, but you could, I felt comfortable when the book came out in 2016. I cannot say that I would have felt so comfortable had it come out earlier. Okay, thank you, Amina. That was a very rich uh, thought that you expressed there. Sunela, I think that your first experimental book, The Line of Lanka, is once again an example of uh, writing that engages with an undercurrent of political issues. Um, yet, I feel that your writing cannot be confined to a particular genre because it um, encompasses myths and legends and political opinion and personal experience and travel and uh, it spans historicism, cartography, travelogue, um, ethnography and memorialization and so on. And I would really like to know what makes you write like that. Well, to answer that, I think the key is uh, you, uh, as you say, it's an experimental book. And uh, I'm not quite uh, sure how conscious I was in uh, spanning uh, such a broad uh, range of subjects. Um, I'm not sure I'd do it again. Um, but I, I think I written the way I experienced this country. Um, I, by training, as I said, I'm an environmental architect. Environmental architecture is a very holistic approach to uh, land management or design, uh, whatever you call it. Uh, you have to understand multiple aspects and take them all on board. It's not uh, like, you know, imposing one single thought. So it, I think um, that is my training. Um, as a woman, as a professional, as a mother, uh, I think one does experience life somewhat differently from, uh, uh, say, somebody else who goes to work, comes home, has no other worries. Um, and I think that's, you, you begin to see the multi facets of everything, everything we experience. And if we look at anything, if we walk out there, uh, I might see the paving, the trees, the field, uh, you know, the uh, breeze, the dust. Someone else might say, I'm going from hall five to four. You know, that's, that's what it is. And I think, so that, that is probably my makeup as a person. What shaped it is, as I said, my training, my profession, my, uh, fact that I'm, uh, I'm a female and I think females have that uh, capacity. Multitasking. The capacity to, yes, uh, take on so many mm. things. And in writing, I think what I've done is, to be very frank, not, not a deliberate, very conscious, I need to put this out and that out and the other thing out. That's the way it came out. Uh, because as I said, for me, writing is a hobby. Um, and uh, I, I think if I didn't write the way I did, I'd probably be cheating the subject that are uh, the main subject, which is Sri Lanka. Um, and I think I would definitely have lost the dimension in the narrative if I didn't, uh, my, if my writing didn't encompass all those, you know, uh, aspects. Okay. And again, Sunila, I would like to. Uh, on a different track now, um, a considerable part of the conflict in Sri Lanka was centered on who stepped foot on the island first, on origins, on migrations, on colonizers, on ancestry, heirs, and progeny. The single ethnic group in the island, in particular, traces their origin to the arrival of the Aryan prince Vijaya on the shores of the northwestern uh, part of the island, uh, as chron uh, chronicled by the Mahavamsa, 
which is a very influential Sinhala Buddhist text um, uh, chronicle uh, around 500 BCE. And if I may quote from your work, you say, in a country that is awash with a cornucopia of historical data and archaeological remains, the less evident and incomprehensible are easily ignored, perhaps due to the claims laid by the predominant Aryan Sinhalese, most of the archaeological sites are casually assigned post-Vijayan origins. As the pre-Vijayan era is only hinted at in the Mahavamsa, the majority of the Sri Lankan population is content to let them remain in darkness. Now, can we ask you to elaborate on those words? Yes, I, I think, you know, so I, I am a member of the predominant race. I am what uh, is um, tagged as an Aryan Sinhala Buddhist. Um, and that is with the tongue in your cheek, you're saying that tongue. Yes, if you read my book, you'll realize it's very tongue in cheek. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, I, I think uh, what brackets uh, the history of the Sinhalese is, is um, a series of chronicles uh, referred to as Mahavamsa, written by the uh, Buddhist clergy. And, uh, you know, that's all about the heroics of the Sinhalese. Um, but in, in that same text, there, there's reference to other races and ethnic groups that people the island before. Uh, and the fact is that in that, uh, though they refer to the beginning of civilization in the country uh, with the arrival of, uh, uh, you know, purported progenitor Prince Vijay of uh, North India, um, there is mention of uh, Nagas and uh, the Yaka and uh, the Rakusa and other tribes um, who I think clearly had uh, culture and civilization. There are references to a battle over a, over a uh, gem studded throne. Now, you couldn't have a gem studded throne if they were, you know, uh, running about naked in the woods. So there must have been civilization. But at the same time, uh, though this uh, chronicle is all about the heroics of uh, the Sinhalese, uh, there is no mention of annihilation of any of those. There is no ethnic cleansing referred to. So I, what I think is this all uh, was, uh, became, uh, we, you know, we absorbed all that. We, we are... Uh, what we are today, what we call ourselves, uh, Sinhalese, are uh, just a big uh, blend of uh, everything that, uh, uh, you know, existed before all the races and ethnic groups. But somehow, as we dominate now, today, um, I know where we'll be 50 years from now, but we are still very insecure. So uh, we could blame it on uh, 27 years of civil war, which shook, uh, you know, the basis of uh, the base of our control. I, but we are very insecure uh, people right now. We are, uh, you know, waving flags of, uh, you know, being a superior race, being the blood of the Singha in, in Sanskrit means the lion race. Uh, and uh, I mean, besides the fact that there are no lions in Sri Lanka, I don't know where this whole lion thing comes from, but yes, we are the lion race right now, and I don't know why we are, we've got into this position where we are constantly defending who we are and what we are and trying to draw, underscore this race and the purity of who we are today. So, um, I, I don't know, um, I guess, uh, I guess that's, I don't know, maybe this is what happens globally when, when you're threatened. Um, so you would say that looking for origins in a way is a politically, a fundamentally political project? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've researched this aspect of Sri Lanka, um, and I would say definitely it's always been a social construct. 
uh, this political construct. Uh, it's, and I think anywhere in the world that, that is what happens because po uh, politicians learn very fast, rulers learn very fast that this is a fabulous tool uh, to shape races, to, uh, you know, draw lines. And the British, as we all know, divide and rule was a part of their policy. Uh, so, yes, um, I, I would definitely uh, say that um, um, to, the, you know, the famous um, uh, Churchillian, Churchillian uh, line, which was, uh, history belongs to the victors. Oh, sorry? No, no, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think Amina was wanting to bring yeah. out the point about your, uh, you were at breakfast saying, telling a story about the origins, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I was. But first I want to tell Sunella, no hope in hell that I'm not going to be writing another book. Because, <laughs> no, because Sunella, I was, so firstly, I just want to state, to all of you, we are the Sri Lankan panel, and actually, you all don't even know the difference. If you didn't have my name, you wouldn't know anything. You wouldn't know what ethnicity we were. We are Sri Lankans. But in Sri Lanka, like maybe in Pakistan, maybe in India, maybe in every country, when you're within, when you're without, you are one cohesive group. And that happened to me when I left my country. I lived in America. I was Sri Lankan all the way. Nobody cared about what ethnicity I was. But when you return, all the, all the minor categories come into play. So when we were having these discussions, breakfast discussions, plain discussions, I mean, and it preoccupies us a lot of the time because we all think alike and we wonder why our country is going through the turmoil it does. So not only do the majority have their insecurities, the minority have even more insecurities. So the minorities are also doing myth-making and they are also saying, you know, we came from here and we came from there. As Maitri said, uh, the Muslims claim that they came from their descendants of Arab traders. What they don't say is that many of them didn't come with women, so they married Sinhalese and Tamil women. So we are a mix, just like any other ethnicity in Sri Lanka. When Sunila was talking about the Aryan Buddhist theory and Vijaya, so Vijaya is this Indian prince who came uh, in 500, yeah, around. around 500 AD, and the Sinhalese say they start from there, in 500 BC, sorry. So when I was doing my Ibn Battuta research, I was trying to map out his route in Sri Lanka, and I was going on the journey, and what I did was, I would just talk to people on the way. I would stop and talk at every temple, every church, every mosque. And in the northwest coast, I came across this little mosque. There was a poor, a, a seemingly beggar-like man who was seated on the steps of the mosque, darning a sack. And so I go up to him, and I chat to him, and I discover who he is, the Muezzin of the mosque. You all know in Pakistan who the Muezzin is. He's a, he's a watch for prayers, the timekeeper. So I started talking to him, and he was like a textbook dream. He was coming out with all the correct answers. I wonder if he wasn't so dirty, I would have kissed him. <laughs> but uh, he might have had a heart attack at that point. So anyway, we started casually talking about how long has this mosque been here? How long have you been here? And he very proudly said, we've been here for centuries. We have deeds from one of the Candian kings dating back 400 uh, years to the land. And all of a sudden, I mean, I didn't even prompt him. He said, you know, we are the origin people. And I really looked at him startled because I'd never heard of a Muslim saying that they are the original inhabitants of Lanka. And I said, really? Why do you say that? And he said, he, was, he said it so beautifully. I hope I can capture their sense. He said, you know, the Sinhalese are always saying they came with Vijaya. We don't say we came with Vijaya. We were here. But we were not Muslim then. We became Muslim. But we have always been here. So we are actually the origin people. And you know, I was just, just totally gobsmacked by that thought. I had never heard anyone express it before. And it made me think that 
Obviously, in the hinterlands of Sri Lanka, people are asking the question, who are we and where do we belong? And I believe personally, it comes about today. We're all asking ourselves, who are we, where do we belong? Because we went through 26 years of brutal conflict. We all lived through it. We all had, we had, we'd never lived elsewhere and came back, you know, after the war ended. We all went through every, every painful minute of it. So um, I was struck by how all our stories are, in fact, connected. Okay. Thank you, Amina. Bhavani now. Sorry to have ignored you for a while. Maitri, you seem very surprised at my answers, <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm actually able, <laughs> able to... <laughs> because Thank I'm you. the clown of the group. <laughs> I keep them in stitches. I didn't, I think she thought I would clown around here as well. I think you're being nasty to me now. <laughs> okay. Bhavani, I want to ask you this. Given that many political disputes uh, between ethnic and religious groups are often founded on contentious or other contentions regarding the genesis of people, purity of race, territorial claims and disagreements, um, the denial of rights and entitlements and benefits and so on. Uh, your collection of essays on trans the transitional justice in Sri Lanka is a book that, uh, that, book that you edited, uh, is a book that looks more towards the future, looks towards rectifying past injustices perhaps. Um, are there any answers to be provided by transitional justice for societies undergoing these kinds of tensions? Um, so one of the reasons I decided a book is needed in terms of addressing or reckoning with the past, and I think South Asia as well as globally, you have so many challenges in what societies go through in terms of violence, conflict, war, authoritarianism, and a range of issues, was the fact that you have very, I mean, as a lawyer, so there are these legal concepts, international standards, um, and we talk a particular jargon but it's not accessible for the people in terms of how is it relevant, how does it resonate with the people of a particular country. So with the changes in Sri Lanka and my own past work and the work you heard, I thought it's very important to look at the history and what um, Amina has also been talking about, the different histories, but you know, not to be stuck in the past, to move forward. And transitional justice in that sense is a concept, a process that looks at different modalities from truth, justice, reparations, and non-recurrence. And the whole point is to address root causes of violence, of conflict, to address, like I mentioned at the very outset, we have huge numbers of disappeared and missing persons across Sri Lanka. So providing answers for communities who are still searching for loved ones, many who've been searching for 20, 30 years, providing redress. A lot of the times you have situations where people have lost homes, land, livelihood, loved ones, and not be compensated. And then a very important thing that Sri Lanka is at least trying to do is to ensure there's no repetition of violence, non-recurrence. So transitional justice in that sense is this all-encompassing process of justice, truth, reparations, non-recurrence. But for me, I was thinking, what is it meaning for Sri Lankans? And so this book, which... Um, which came about with discussions with colleagues in Sri Lanka as well as outside was just trying to look at a broad range, sometimes too academic, sometimes too legal, and make it very local. So I've tapped into all my friends interested in particular areas, but also international. So, you know, transitional justice, while it's new to Sri Lanka, 
It's, an, it's a concept that we've seen in South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Argentina, Peru, Guatemala. We've seen the abuelas, the madres, that's the mothers and the gra grandmothers searching for loved ones, searching for their children for decades. So you learn examples. In Asia, we've seen Nepal, Cambodia, East Timor struggling, you know, with this transitional justice. So the book is really meant to raise issues, to challenge norms, challenge ideas, and most importantly, that whole thing about recognizing. Recognizing that there's history, um, that history is also very different. People have different memories. But there has to be recognition that that history also has given us some lessons. So in a very simple way, TJ could be classified, in my words, as something reckoning with the past, but trying to move forward, but very much grounded in history. And I think that's the most simple I can say in terms of a very complicated, complex process that's not linear. It's so messy. It's so contested. Um, and in a way, the book kind of also challenges certain notions, because sometimes it's seen as the global north. This is very much a global south exercise. But looking at our own histories and learning from it. So I think that's the simplest answer that a lawyer can give on this. We are very grateful. Thank you. But actually, you're talking about multiple histories of bigger histories, dominant histories, marginalized histories, and so on. And on that, um, if, would you say, Sunella, that history then is a social construction uh, that we just make it up as we go along? I know you tried to refer to that earlier, and we got on to Amina's yes, point. I think, but I think the thought process uh, carries on, and I think that's where the uh, whole uh, um, question of uh, history is being politically derived, uh, then being socially constructed. Uh, yes, I'd say so. And, you know, I think uh, the Maasai have a very apt saying. It says, until they say, the, the Maasai of Africa say, until lions are the historians, tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunters. And, um, I think this happens constantly where uh, history is presented in a certain way. History is presented in a certain way, sorry. Um, and that's a matter of convenience to whoever uh, is powerful enough to command that. Um, you know, whether they be patrons, they be kings, uh, whoever. And uh, then over time, people, societies imbibe that story that's been fed to them uh, deliberately, um, uh, which uh, I think is human nature. You pass on something that's written even easier than some than oral traditions um, uh, or oral can histories. Give, can you give some examples from your book? Yes, um, and yes I will read something from the book. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, uh, in, in time, if for instance, we had a recent example where, where say, a politician, his uh, followers, his psychophants, probably his PR people kept referring to him as a god and a king. <laughs> and in a democracy, uh, you found a lot of society beginning to refer to him as a king. And that was presentation. And I, uh, I will quote from my book here, um, where... Uh, said, uh, that I, I quoted this before, but I will say it again. Um, as Vincent Churchill said, history is written by the victors, and thus did his enemies distort the character of Ravana. In the epic Ramayana, Rama's personal scribe, Valmiki, recording Rama's journey to power, demonizes their fallen enemy, misinterpreting the metaphorical Dasai Stana, ten heads, uh, that referred to the ten kingdoms Ravana ruled. Valmiki portrayed him instead as a ten-headed king of demons. Rakusas were not demons, but protectors in whose care, or Raksa, the sacred lands of Lanka remained. 
The meaning of the word was misrepresented any time the demonic representation of the Rakusa took precedence. The ultimately victorious Prince Rama was deified and presented by Valmiki as an incarnation of their god, Lord Vishnu. The Indian princes' heroics over the mighty Ravana gripped neighboring India as this interpre interpretation proliferated. Thank you, Sunila. Uh, then, so, multiple histories, and I want to return to Bhavani now, um, because, in a sense, in terms of transitional justice, we are moving away from the singular history, as we discussed just a while ago, to the plurality in histories. And we're talking about multiplicity, diversity, diverse histories, narratives, and more than anything else, when it comes to truth. And when you have diverse truths, then people kind of tend to disintegrate, fall down. Um, and particularly when, when these are political truths and which may be complementary on the one hand, but most often they are not, political truths are not complementary uh, and they would clash. Um, so as we begin to understand that there are as many truths as there are people, uh, what can, can you say about that? How much time do I have? This is like a conference, but uh, no, look, I, <laughs> A, a, a society that's transitioning, and that's in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, across the South Asian region, globally, any society that's experienced violence, experienced past abuses, authoritarianism, extremism, there is always going to be contestation of what's happened in the past, and it's linked to one's memories, one's experiences, so the multiplicity of narratives of truth is there. And I think the fundamental point is recognizing that diversity, the fact that there will be contested truths. It's where people come from. And if there is space for that, I think it's, uh, then there is more scope for reconciliation. But reconciliation, again, is not one dominant narrative. It's creating that space for different voices, different experiences. And in some of my writing, I talk about the work of, I think everyone knows the um, Nigerian novelist Chimamanda Adichie, who has spoken about the dangers of the single story. She's written about it, but anyone who may not want to read it, watch her TED speech, because it's very powerful, it's very poignant in terms of us who go through transitions and face these challenges. And her point is that a single story, that one of the dangerous aspects of a single narrative is that it's incomplete, that it, does, it fails to recognize different aspects. And I think that's a very basic thing that I think we all may know, but we may not want to recognize. And sometimes it's convenient to just go in one direction. So I think end of the day, multiple truths, multiple narratives is so critical in terms of respecting people's rights, dignity. But if it's to be a functioning democracy, there also has to be tolerance. There has to be respect, recognition. And basically, my, I mean, uh, there's, there's no, for me, there's no debate. Even though it may be contested, messy, there has to be that space where different people have the space to debate, to have conversations. And as a human rights lawyer activist who've seen from some very dire times in Sri Lanka, I have to say, the transition in Sri Lanka since 2015, while it may be imperfect, it has given us the space to at least recognize different communities went through different experiences. And that's a conversation, a starting point to at least try to move forward. It's not going to be easy, it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be messy, it's going to be long. But one thing is the fact that there's recognition of the multiplicity and the diversity, and that's why it's so critical. Um, and I think time, we are running short of time now, if we are, if 
the audience Sorry. also wants to speak. Uh, in conclusion, then, Amina, um, would you care to read to us from your book or any of the books, perhaps, Moon on? I'll be happy to read, but would you mind if I read for five minutes or is that too long? What do you think, audience? <laughs> okay. there you are. So I've tried to choose three excerpts to reflect the subject. So the first one is on conflict, second one on identity, and the third one, I will announce on what it is later because I wanted to end on a more positive note, right? So this is a young girl who has come back. Her father has been blown up in a bomb and uh, she's discovered that he has died while she was traveling. It's a terrible thing to hear of a death delayed. Every little detail of where you were and what you were doing when that death occurred is recurred, is recalled and mulled over. Khadija cannot remember anymore much of Cordoba or Carmona, Cuenca, Zafra, Trujillo, or any of the magical places they traveled through. All she remembers was that she was in Seville when her father died. It will always be with her that while she walked through the Alcazar in Seville, marveling at what she thought was a shared history with Abdullah, her father was wrecked apart by a violence inflicted by another human being who also believed in his history. While she stared in awe at the magnificent cathedral, people gaped at his body lying torn and twisted on the street. As she meandered through the streets buying souvenirs and choosing artisanal tiles, his blood stained the corner like a reminder that would never go away. A country's history, she, she reflected bitterly, is always written in blood. The second passage is, you know, I told you about the two adopted siblings. So she has met her brother. She has hunted him down, met him. And she's going through a strange sort of emotional turmoil within her. You will guess at it when, when I read the passage. At the same time, her, her sibling, her natural, her biological brother, has gone through the, the uh, conflict in the South that also Sri Lanka went through. So she says, who am I? Who is he? Is he my brother? And yet how can that be? I have never known him as a brother. I love him unlike a sister. This night, as I sat next to him, feeling his arms around me, I felt a strange and fearful passion. Where do we go from here? It is a question I cannot ask him as I fear the answer. I want reason banished from my heart. I want to live on the edge of insanity, to experience utter and total madness. I think about the story he told me yesterday, Suarez's story. It is chilling, and I fear for my country. I'm confused. He seems untouched by these horrors, almost anesthetized from brutality. Is this what happens to a country when it turns upon itself? Do we lose the ability to feel? And yet I know that a tragedy like this will remain in our country's pores. We will always have it in our souls, this tragedy and the others that we have experienced. And finally, because I don't want to end on a downward note, this is a bit bittersweet, but it's hopefully more sweet. The young woman was estranged from her adoptive mother and she goes back uh, and the adoptive mother tries to reconcile with her for not having told her she was adopted. She finds out in a terrible way that she was adopted. Raushan Gul placed the... So the young girl's name is Khadija and the mother's name is Raushan Gul. Raushan Gul placed the bundle of wrapped cloth into Khadija's hands. As she began to open it, Khadija knew from its shape and wrapping that it would be some jewelry. I don't want it, she began to protest. But Raushan Gul urged her to open the package. Your grandmother gave it when you were 15 years old to be given to you on your marriage. She didn't think she would live to see it. They both stared at the diamond clustered bracelet. It's not right, Khadija whispered. This should not come to me. Give it to Sabrina or to any one of Auntie Yasmin's children. Ummi should not give it to me. As Raushan Gul fastened it onto Khadija's thin wrist, she said, when I brought you home as a little baby, your grandmother didn't like you. 
She said you were ugly, that you were some half-caste child, probably illegitimate, with no lineage. She would visit every day, say these nasty things to me, but always save a smile, tickle, or a hug for you. Then she began quietly giving you her finger, coated with sugar to taste, and feed you bits of chocolate and cake. All the time she would come and scold me for bringing you to the house, and yet began to feed you sweets and sugar, and soon you loved her more than you loved me. How you adored her. Maybe you do not remember this time, but when all around her was petrified as they heard her waist chain jingle ominously, you would giggle and crow with delight at the thought of seeing her. One day, when you were about two years old, I came home and found you seated next to her, dwarfed by her immense buttocks, clutching at her hips, learning to pray the Surah Fatiha. When I told my mother that I was pregnant for the first time, she was joyous, but she also remembered you. The child has brought the gift of pregnancy, she said. Don't you forget it. Khadija began to weep. Inelegant gasps of pain and sadness ripped through her being as she felt yet another part of her heart cleave in two. So much for me to know. So much for me to forgive. So much for me to love. And yet, I am not ready. Thank you. Um, I think we have about three minutes left, if anyone cares to, oh, whoops, <laughs> okay. Quick questions. Quick questions, yes. Who are you question, uh, posing your question to? One question each, huh? One question. <laughs> Okay, um, look, I think very quickly since we Shall have... Shall we take a few yeah, questions? Yeah, should. Yeah. Okay, so you have note of that? Yes, yeah. sir. Very interesting, very interesting conversation, thank you. Um, history is the story of victors. I just latched on to that. And I also realized that um, it sparks different kinds of writing. In, for some women, I would say, it sparked a search for identity, for others a search for solutions. What do we do, where do we go from here? I also wanted to find out how men's writings were influenced by the 30-year war, 27-year war, because war does bring on hyper-nationalism, <clears throat> hyper-masculinity. Did that feed misogyny or normalization of misogyny in the writing of men? And perhaps, how did it impact the women also? So continuing with you. that uh, aspect about history being sort of narrated by the vic uh, to those who uh, achieve victory, I just wanted to ask that as a writer, uh, if you're part of, um, say, the dominant race or the, high, the upper class, how do you use your privilege to represent those who don't have that voice or those who are in minorities? Mm -hmm. And how important is that representation for the transitional justice that Bhavni talked about? How does it help in that transition? So uh, that's it. Just one more question, one more and you, you all can all take one minute each mm -hmm. to wind up. No? All right, I'll try to be precise. Uh, thank you for this interesting conversation. Um, so the thing is, as women, I realize that we all experience our political spaces a lot differently than men. And we all have a very different relationship to our nationhood or the idea of patriotism or the idea that you, how you relate, right? And I feel like Pakistan and Sri Lanka have had a similarly turmoil past, turmoil-filled past, right? So I, the question, please. Yeah, I, I just want to ask that um, as women, how far do you feel an obligation, because you all have different professions and you all write fiction or non-fiction, how much of an obligation did you feel to represent women's history? Because like you said, 
history often isn't told by the eyes of a female or how women experience it. So if you could just elaborate on very that. Very good question. Thank you very much. Uh, um, no, let's, let's start with Amina. Start. Okay. So, uh, One minute, uh, we, because I think we'll get kicked out otherwise. It's I'll just talk very quickly about the publishing, about uh, men's writing. So we did publish an army officers. It was a thriller uh, that happened during the war. And actually in Sri Lanka, we have not published much thriller work. So it was a man's, it was kind of a man's adrenaline kind of fix. So he knew all his stuff and he was, he had fought in the war. So it was a kind of boys novel, but, and he did very, very well amongst the men. The women did not like it, they didn't pick it up. Uh, the other, what? <laughs> the, actually, when you ask that question, who asked the question? I suddenly realized most of the people we published had been uh, women. And the few men we published have done nonfiction. So they are mostly into facts and figures. And it has been women who has been doing much of the writing. But there is one book which we didn't publish. I wish we had. It won the DSC prize. It was called Chinaman. And so that was a very interesting book because it wove sports and it wove cricket. violence and it wove cricket. society cricket. and cricket. So uh, it, it was a very sensitively written book. So I think uh, if men write, it, 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 it just depends on what they're interested in. I'll stop. About the predominant race, and I think the responsibility. I think uh, I feel that yes, there is a responsibility when you are in that uh, position to uh, expose the multiple truths, as uh, Bhavani would say, and I think. Uh, you can do that. You can uh, you can call yourself whatever you want, uh, with the confidence that uh, minorities don't have. And if you don't do that, I think you actually misunderstood your position and your power as a member of the of the dominant race. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't even have a minute, so very quickly, just to say on the curricula. Uh, that's a huge problem, and that's a problem that as activists, as academics, uh, we've been trying to influence and bring in change, but that is one of those things that if you don't get it right early on, it's a huge problem, and Sri Lanka is a good example. Just, uh, just, uh, sorry, go on. No, I, I think uh, before I get thrown out, um, just to say, uh, just to confirm this thing about Narratives, identity, I think that's so important, but it's up to each of us, be it from the majority or the minority, to push the issues. And in a society where there is always going to be contestation and challenges, it's very important to stand by the principal positions, however unpopular it is, and I'll end that. All right, I just want to um, nuance that a little bit. It's, so it's not the, the curricular issue, it's not only in terms of whose ethnicity is predominant in school curricula. Uh, it has been the singular predominant version. It's also a case of gender, because it's all, always been male uh, dominant uh, images and narratives and so on. And although we have revised curricula from a gender perspective from time to time, it somehow creeps back in. So thank you very much, the audience. Thank you. Thank you to my panelists. And I would also like to thank the Lahore Literature Festival Committee, particularly my good friend Rafi Ahmed for giving us this opportunity to come here. Uh, and he has done it so generously and wholeheartedly for us to come and showcase women's writing in Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming to listen to us, even though you all didn't know anything about us. <laughs>